Before we get started, I'm going to show a little bit of a preview of the center where I work. My name is Donnell Walton, and I'm the director of the Corning Technology Center in Silicon Valley. Corning Technology Center Silicon Valley was founded as Corning West Technology Center about 10 years ago to be a listing post for Corning in California. We realized that we had centers like this for the research, development, or manufacturing centers all over the world, but the California economy being about $2.4 trillion in gross state product was an opportunity that we needed for localization in. We have four core competencies here, Applied Material Science, Applied Physics, Mechanical Engineering, and Electrical Engineering. So about two-thirds of the people here at CTCSV are scientists, where the other third are account managers and business development managers. So that one-third, obviously they spend a lot, of, almost all of their time here in Silicon Valley in different customers, with different customers, either hosting them or visiting them. The interesting thing is the other two-thirds of us who are scientists, because of our proximity to it, our customer base and our partner base, we spend a lot of our time at the customer site or hosting customers here trying to understand and directly solve problems by building prototypes and doing joint research. I had two major objectives when I founded Corning Technology Center in Silicon Valley. Number one is to tell the Corning story to companies in Silicon Valley and universities in Silicon Valley by taking this inside out and also bringing the best management practices and a lot of the technological advancements in Silicon Valley inside Corning. Number two is with the connections I have and the network I had over 30 years here in Silicon Valley, I was able to hire a very strong team, really the cream of the crop for research and development. We love Silicon Valley. It's a tremendous uh, innovation hotspot in the world. Uh, a lot of action here and uh, the ecosystem in Silicon Valley is also tremendous. Right? We have collaborating companies, we have universities and a tremendous ecosystem, so it's a really important part of our broad uh, global footprint and uh, it's, it's great to be here. Partners are a critical ingredient in our innovation recipe. Uh, this lab gives us a presence in Silicon Valley that will help us connect with our current customers, develop new customers, uh, provide insights into new technology trends and how our core capabilities in manufacturing and engineering platforms can be deployed to generate the next round of life-changing innovation. Okay, so now you know a little bit about my background. Today I want to talk to you about our role in the coming age of robots. We've all seen robots in the media, on TV and in movies. So we'll play a game called Name That Robot. So the first robot is BB-8 from The Force Awakens and also The Last Jedi. The next one is from an earlier era is Kit or The Night Industries 2000 from the TV show Knight Rider. Here we have Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek The Next Generation. This was a big hit with the middle and high school students. This is Baymax from Big Hero 6. This is Optimus Prime from Transformers. This was one of my favorites from uh, growing up and going to movies. This is the T-1000 from Terminator 2. This is Dorian from a TV show called Almost Human. He was a an android that had a what they called a synthetic soul and he had a deep deeply deep emotional engagement and the ability to reason this one was a tricky one because this is Letitia Wright playing Rennie in another TV show British show called humans this was a tricky one in the sense that Rennie was not an android or, or a robot she was a human but 
in this TV show, it was an alternate present where artificial, artificially intelligent beings were a part of the everyday environment. And as a result of that, or a side effect of that, some people were starting to have this syndrome where they would act as though they were synthetic organisms. They were act as though they were robots. So she was suffering from this ailment. And you'll see Letitia Wright again at the end of this talk. Those are all fictional robots, but there are lots of real robots too. One of the most popular, well, before that, the uh, Sojourner Mars Rover was a popular uh, one from a few years ago. The most popular commercial one right now is the Roomba. Uh, automated vacuum cleaner and you can see from this clip that you'd better learn how to use these if you want to um, continue to be viable this cat has used the robot to afford a uh, an advantage over his canine canine colleague Jibba is a robot that was invented and recently purchased by LG it is a um, lots of sensors and it's all about being able to interface and react to human. Boston Dynamics recently, or just late last year, demonstrated this Atlas robot that can do a lot of cool things, including this backflip that he stuck the landing, as he's proud of. But bipedal movement is quite difficult, so they've been able to demonstrate mastery of this. And this is one from my neighborhood. This is from Nightscope. This is a five foot tall, 300 pound robot that here it's being, sh it's, it's being shown to patrol the Stanford Mall in, uh, in Palo Alto. And recently there have been some pretty interesting incidents with this robot. One, it, it ran into a 16 month old toddler injured the leg of the toddler and even more recently these robots are being used to uh, discourage the development of homeless encampments in San Francisco but the homeless are not without defense they've been doing things such as spraying the sensors with barbecue sauce and confusing the robots so the question becomes what exactly is a robot by definition, it's a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically, especially one programmable by a computer. So that's what a robot is. So in a, in a lot of ways, our cell phones can be considered robots, uh, certainly computers. And this is being magnified recently by the advent or kind of the current generation of artificial intelligence or machine learning. One very public demonstration of this was when Watson, the IBM contribution to this field, competed on Jeopardy, and you can see from the scores, did extremely well. What's noteworthy about this is that Watson was not connected to the internet. This was all based on you know, statistical learning in the, in, the, in the computer itself. The interesting thing about machine learning is that these Computers with these algorithms can solve problems that they weren't explicitly programmed to solve in the first place. And here's a picture of me at, at, at visiting Watson in New York. Uh, there's, there's 90 Power 750 clusters at IBM Thomas Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights. What was interesting is that previous slide where you, you saw them, that was not the Alex Trebek when he hosted it, that was not in the standard Jeopardy studio. It was all had to be set up at IBM uh, here at Watson because the computer was just too large to move. So what's happening with machine learning is you can see that this is a, a comparison, kind of a generic comparison showing human performance over time and computer com performance. And this kind of inflection point is demonstrating the advent of what we're seeing now with the raw computing power increase using a graphic processing units and um, kind of AI or machine learning optimized hardware 
and different algorithms such as decision tree learning, inductive logic programming, clustering, reinforcement learning. So we're, we're here, so we're certainly about to see computers overtake humans in doing the Sorry, things that computers that. can do. Last year, 2017, McKinsey, the consulting firm, released a report that showed, that predicted that about a third of today's jobs will be replaced by automation by the year 2030. So this corresponds to about 800 million jobs worldwide. And these jobs are span the gamut of professions from manufacturing, waiters, cashiers, but it's not just blue collar roles that will be displaced by computers, automation, or what we can call robots, but also white collar roles, such as medical doctors. Mm -hmm. Some of you know, these, these uh, recent demonstrations have shown that computers can be more accurate in reading digital radiography or computerized tomography or identifying tumors than, than, than actual human doctors. Research assistants can be displaced by computers, the, the, the ability to just read and distill, you know, terabytes and petabytes of data down, I mean, much faster than, and much more effectively than, than human researchers can. So how do we face this crisis of these machines being able to outperform humans? I use the term crisis here by its denotation of being both a time of danger and opportunity. This comic kind of demonstrates the what we're really up against. This is a gentleman that's being let go by his job, his manager or outplacement manager, telling him that, you, that he's not being replaced by a robot, he's being replaced by someone who understands robots. So there is a paradox of computers. Because humans can acquire a lot more knowledge from less data, and computers lack context. For example, the Watson that I showed earlier, Sorry, that was I don't know that. that was competing on Jeopardy, doesn't understand context, and therefore would continue to play the game even if the building were to catch on fire. So the paradox of computers is that what's hard for people is easy for artificial intelligence and vice versa. Many things that are easy for artificial intelligence is hard for people. So the way for us to maintain our relevancy and, 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 not, and not just relevancy, to, but to, to thrive in this is to master what I'm calling technological literacy. So when we talk about technological literacy, so there are two aspects to literacy. The one that's most commonly thought of is the ability to read. But only being able to read would make one semi-literate because one must also be able to write in order to be considered literate. So just as literacy implies being able to read and write a language, technological literacy means being able to not only use technology, but to be able to create and master technology. So technological literacy is the first step toward maintaining our relevance and capacity and agency in this coming age of robots. But we want to go from mere literacy to fluency to actual mastery of technology. So I want to talk now about some steps to mastering technology, to achieving this technological fluency. The first one is to address your mindset. So there has been some recent work by Carol Dweck, a professor at Stanford, where they talk about how our, there are two mindsets, and there's, these, these are kind of endpoints of a continuum, I would say. There's a fixed mindset where 
we say that when we experience failures, it's the limit of our abilities. Um, I mean, I'm either good at something or I'm not good at something. I, you know, I, I, it is what it is. I am who I am. I don't really like to be challenged because it points out things that I don't know. And when I get frustrated, you know, I give up. So as a result, I stick to what I know. But there's also a growth mindset, which is leverages failure as an opportunity to grow and to jump into things and learn to do basically anything you want to learn how to do and realizing that challenges aren't something that define you, but there's the opportunities to help you show who you are and who you can be. And then feedback is not complaining or telling you that you're not good, but it is more specifically an opportunity for you to, to grow. One example that Carol Dweck talked about was introducing this concept of growth mindset to middle school students. And in the process of doing so, she encountered a tr big troublemaker, a young boy who was just known historically as being a troublemaker. And as he was, he was starting to get the gist of what she was saying, he actually started to cry uh, when he was introduced to this concept, this idea that our, our mind, and specifically his mind, was malleable and could change. He looked up to the instructors with tears in his eyes and said, you mean I don't have to be dumb? Carol Dweck said it was like a fire had been lit under him. So one word that captures the growth mindset for me, and I think also for uh, Professor Dweck is, you know, people say you can't, don't, you know, don't say can't. It's fine to say can't, but the most important word is, I can't do this. Important word is yet. So the most important takeaway from a growth mindset is yet. When you're faced with things, don't expect to get them on the first try. Don't expect to have a natural talent for things. Don't expect things to be easy, but expect things, you put the time in, expect to actually be able to catch on to it. You will definitely figure it out. The second thing is to recognize that there are three dimensions of intelligence. The first, this is I'm borrowing from the Triarchic Theory of Intelligence by Richard Sternberg. The first aspect of intelligence, the one that probably over the determines and we spend too much time on, is the analytical intelligence. This is the ability for an individual to solve problems that they've met in the past. So this is the intelligence that we typically just boil all aspects of intelligence down to. And so this is this is what's measured by standardized IQ tests, standardized tests, GPAs, course grades, you know, all of these quantifiable, you know, psychometric uh, measures. But another aspect of intelligence is the creative aspect of intelligence. This is our ability to solve problems, the type of which you have not engaged before. This is what we typically talk about as creative, coming up with something altogether new. You know, this is something that's not necessarily captured in the analytical aspect of intelligence. And the third aspect of this triarch model is practical intelligence. This is looking at the social aspects of a problem and daily problems, and it's related to social intelligence or emotional intelligence, but this is the ability to figure out and discern which problems are actually worthy of being solved in the first place. So this is kind of common sense or practical things. T together, these, these three create what, what we should look at as intelligence. The third way to master technological fluency is to succeed in school. So two things to do in that is you know, how to take notes. Um, there's been a lot of work done recently that shows that writing notes, not, not typing them, helps us to better remember them. It, it's a tactile phenomenon writing. It gives us a, another aspect of how our neurons are wired to, uh, to recall things and make connections. Even if you digitize or put these things in the computer later or you write on your screen, you definitely want to write it first before you end up typing it out. Another mechanical aspect of taking notes you may want to try is kind of a two column method where you would write a line two thirds of a way 
uh, down the page, kind of like this line here. And then take notes in the wider part over here. And then later when you go back to review your notes, write things in the, you know, kind of summarize in this wider margin that you've created in this one third of the uh, way across the page. So it's a nice way to uh, be able to go back, review the notes, and then make them even more quickly glanceable in the future. And a third recommendation I have for you to take a notes is draw pictures. Uh, sketches definitely help us understand things. And, and these things don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a Picasso or early Picasso when his, when his drawings were more realistic. Just, just draw diagrams, sketch things out. A lot, you know, visual reasoning, visual thinking is a, a good way to help learn difficult topics. Another aspect of succeeding in school is, is how to study. So three aspects of this is, one is distributed practice. Uh, take breaks, don't cram things, don't, don't try to take these, do these marathon study sessions. You know, take frequent breaks. So spread out your studying, don't, don't try to do everything at once. And the recommendation here is in order to be able to do that, of course, you can't wait till the last minute. You know, start early, start as soon as you're introduced to concepts or even before you're introduced to concepts, start studying them. The second one is take practice tests. Even if you have to make tests up yourself, take them. I mean, a lot of people think if they highlight things, it's, it's good. But I mean, the real test of whether or not you know something is if you can answer questions about it. Which brings me to the last aspect of studying is be able to discuss what you're learning. Talk about your new concepts with anyone, even if you don't really understand them totally. Talk about them with your classmates, with your relatives, with your friends, basically anyone who will listen. Talk about these things. This is really how we learn is by trying to teach or discuss. Keep in mind that one of my favorite teachers told me that subjects are, they are taught from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but they're actually learned between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. So they're learned out of class. They're learned by discussing them. So I want to talk about one of the differences between the U.S. and I'll pick China as an example in math performance. So China typically outperforms the U.S. on standardized tests in, in high school. And one big reason here is in the United States, when we don't do well in math, we tend to say we're just not good in math or that's just not our thing, or I don't have a mathematical mind. Whereas in China, when the students don't do well, they say that they didn't work hard enough. They realize that math is not some esoteric phenomenon that transcends our brain's wiring. It's something that we just need to put the time and effort into in order to get our brains wired to be able to do math. It's a matter of putting in the time, working, failing, figuring it out, coming back to it. Work hard, you get math. This is simple, but not easy. And the difference between simple and easy is that running a marathon, for example, is very simple. You just put one foot in front of the other foot in front of the other foot for 26.2 miles. Very simple, but not necessarily easy. And I'll tell my own story about this. When I was a rising senior in high school, I was fortunate enough to go to an engineering uh, introductory course at a very uh, competitive, uh, globally competitive school. And at this engineering course, I was blown away. I did not do well in the physics, in the math. It was just beyond me. And this was interesting because I was, you know, pretty much an all-A student up until that point, And I was just getting blown away. Uh, it just, just too much for me. The most important thing that happened was once the course was over, I was looking at the reviews and my physics instructor wrote a review and it said in it, among other things, that Donnell accepted the impossibility of his situation. And I read that multiple times and I, and I just had no idea at the time that this was something that I had control over. I had accepted the impossibility of the situation. This was one of the three most important events from my youth to realize that I had a choice in whether or not I succeed or fail. Which brings me to a very good quote from Jersey Gregoric. 
who says, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. Another, this quote is often attributed to different people, Peter Drucker, Alan Kay, but the gist of it is the best way to predict the future is to invent it ourselves. So I wanna talk about what this future will do, but I'll do it in some very familiar terms that you to talk about how this future that we create once we achieve this technological fluency, what, what is it that we can do? The good news is that back in February, Ryan Kugler gave us, he did the work for us. He gave us a very interesting perspective on what the future could look like in his rendition of the fictional country of Wakanda. This movie, Black Panther, was a fabulous movie, a lot, a lot of fun, um, not, not only as a superhero movie, but as a uh, you know, kind of an, an uplifting movie. Lots of great characters, lots of women depicted, um, sympathetic anti-heroes in, in uh, Eric, Eric B. Jordan's uh, quote-unquote villain. But the most, I will argue now that the problem of this was STEM. But let, let's talk about some of the technologies and science that we saw in there and, and to talk about it in the context of how far away is it from being reality, if ever. So one of the first ones we saw was a coral here was flying uh, the ship home back from Nigeria to, when they collected uh, Lupita. And you can see that she's flying just by moving her hands in space. So these are gestural interfaces, very similar to the Microsoft Connect that uses cameras, uh, infrared sensors to detect where you are and feed that back in order to be able to guide or interact. It, it, it's a human machine interface that doesn't take any contact. It's just by your gestures. So this is something that already exists. Optical camouflage was used in the movie as their ship came to land in Wakanda. Uh, the outside world thought of Wakanda as being surrounded by an impenetrable rainforest. But we find out here is that that was just camouflage. And there are ways that we can do that now. People have been working on optical metamaterials uh, creating an invisibility cloak where light can be refracted completely around a material and so there, and you see what's behind it therefore making the object that's enveloped by the metamaterial invisible also virtual reality can can you know these holographic projections can be emitted to uh, make things appear um, very differently than they actually appear so this is something that is very close to Vibranium, the, right, the meteor that, that landed in Wakanda and, and, and it was the source of so many of its technological um, advancements. Is this something that could exist? Well, they talk about it as a very low density metal, about a third of the density of a typical metal. So there are metals that are very tough, like that aluminum is a metal similar to that, titanium is a metal similar to that, but the other aspect of vibranium that's more interesting is that it can, by changing its atomic structure, store energy. There are no metals or elements that can do that today, but there are materials that can change their structure due to uh, energy. One is a shape memory alloy. Um, there's also a class of materials called piezoelectric materials. But one thing that's probably most close to vibranium are, but these are compounds, not elements, are solid, solid phase change materials. So these are materials where you introduce energy to them, their phase will change or their, their, their molecular structure will change to store that material or that, that energy and then later can relax back to this, this other uh, phase releasing the energy. So there are materials, not elemental materials, that can you know, do some, some things that are similar to vibranium, but vibranium elementally uh, doesn't exist. When we first saw Black Panther in action, it was in Nigeria, and he jumped out of his ship and threw three beads that landed on these trucks and disabled their uh, electric and uh, mechanical aspects of the trucks, disabled the trucks, and also disabled the comms 
communications links between the soldiers that he was uh, liberating his ex-girlfriend, Nakia, from. These can behave very much like what's known as an electromagnetic pulse that happens after a nuclear explosion. A huge electromagnetic pulse is emitted, or EMP, and it will take out communications, uh, any kind of electrical uh, electrical machines that would ha happen. And also there's been recent work uh, by the military to just make a device that would just work on the EMP without the necessity of a nuclear explosion. And not only was there lots of kind of fictional and science fictional uh, technology uh, demonstrated in the movie Black Panther, but one thing I would point out also that a lot of technology was used in the making of the movie itself. For example, on the left here, Lupita, she's wearing this beautiful dress that's covered in the glyphs or the language of Wakanda. This dress was 3D printed for her. And so there was a lot of 3D printing used in, you know, in the sets and in making models of the set so he could, uh, Ryan Coogler could, you know, see things easily, not just in screens, but in a, basically had little play sets where he could actually place things and, and would help him to uh, align his thinking, his visual thinking. So lots of technology was used in the making of it. Another very cool thing that we saw was The Shuri uh, made this very cool new suit, which was made of basically nanoscopic robots that are able to uh, emanate from the necklace and create this suit on the wearer of the necklace. These are these are robots, but they're very small robots, nanoscopic, 10 to the minus nine. So there are a billion of them in a meter. And they are able, and there are recent work being done, DNA assembly is being done like this now. We're able to make DNA sized robots. And also there's a lab called Swarm Labs that has been able to model or understand and mimic nature. For example, ants, when ants are able to create bridges um, of themselves over obstructions like water or or, or different things like that. The, the, the ants themselves basically follow very simple rules. One is to stay in place and to let people or let the other ants come over their back. And two, once they no longer feel ants going to their back to, 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 to advance themselves. So there's all these simple rules. Swarm Labs is using drones and programming with these rules and allowing them, although they're not microscopic, but to be able to have very simple rules to be able to make structures or make uh, fly information. So we do have some of these, some of these um, devices are as not as far-fetched as they may seem. The magnetic levitation trains were uh, shown to transport the vibranium in the, in the mountain there. And this is where the uh, final uh, fight between Black Panther, Black Panther and Killmonger uh, occurred. Uh, magnetic levitation trains, they exist, they, they operate now in Jap Japan and China, and there are proposed systems in the U.S. and the European Union and even other countries. And also we see the, uh, the founder of Tesla working on making uh, these Hyperloop technologies. So, you know, these are things that already exist, not as efficiently as they did in the movie, but they are definitely working to improve. So, not as far even the Jabari up in the mountains, they had their own technology. They're in this frozen area and they were able to use the uh, resources available to them to save the life of T'Challa by uh, cryonic or cryogenic suspension to, to slow down his, his heart rate and his, his, blood, his blood pressure and all of his uh, cardiovascular function so he could, until he can actually get uh, healed. So this is a technology that exists and, to, and, 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 and being used to various degrees now. So uh, I showed her, Letitia Wright, I saw this actress early on as someone who was pretending to be an android in the TV show Humans. I would argue that she was one of the, the main heroes of the movie, but more importantly, that hero but really STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics were the real key to the greatness of what
So when we people talk about Wakanda forever, him forever. So this is the Wakandan flag for if you've never seen it before. Thank you very much.